Welcome to the Historical Motion Picture Organization, a podcast in which I interpret ancient historical events as if they were the basis for dramatized HBO style productions. Our first fictional HBO production, The Poison King, will explore the life and times of King Mithridates VI of Pontus in his struggles against the Roman Republic and his attempts to preserve the existence of the waning Hellenistic world. In the last episode, we explored the centuries before the events of our show and established the world that Mithridates will exist in. So let's have some action. Let's get our opening scenes onto the screens of our viewers. It's Sunday night, it's 9pm, and episode 1 is about to premiere on HBO. There's a certain event that occurs in 120 BC, which allows me to introduce Mithridates with a bang. This occurrence gives me the event that thrusts the protagonist into the main action of the story. This inciting incident is the assassination of Mithridates' father, the reigning king Mithridates V. After the cold open which depicts the comet of 135 BC, we begin with a panicked squad of young men, scurrying down narrow Greek streets, trying to reach some stables before they are detected. The king is dead, poisoned at a lavish banquet. Are these guys the killers? The viewer knows nothing. They've just been dropped into the middle of this. The camera seems to focus on one more than the others in particular. A tall, husky, elethic young man with swept back curls of golden brown hair. This is our protagonist for the next seven decades. This is Prince Mithridates. Let's cut back to the king's corpse, still on the floor, heaped on its side. He's fallen off his chair after consuming poisoned wine, his hands still clawing at his closed throat. The atmosphere is tense and nervy. Courtiers and eunuchs stand around and whisper to one another. Who's responsible for this? Who takes over the realm now? Who benefits from the death of the king? Dwayne W. Roller in Empire of the Black Sea attempts to cast a little light on the incident. Quote, There are no details about the plot, except Strabo's statement that the king was killed by his friends, a term in Hellenistic royalty referring to the monarch's inner circle. This seems to rule out his family, although it is difficult to imagine that they were not involved, given that the event occurred at the royal capital of Sinope and the turbulent start to the following reign. This group of paranoid and desperate men we see fleeing could be the killers. It's plausible, or else they could be on the victim's side. Are they next on the hit list? The king may have been a surprise hit, but now the plot is out in the open. Are they mounting horses in a panic because they're guilty? Or are they fleeing because they're in danger? Roller continues, quote, Nevertheless, even if the efforts to do away with Prince Mithridates are exaggerated, there is no doubt that there was dissension at the Pontic court. The king had been assassinated by his inner circle, and there was no adult male successor. There probably were at least two hostile factions at the court in 120 BC, those around the family of Mithridates V and the friends who had assassinated him, although these groups need not to have been mutually exclusive. End quote. Let's note something here. The person who stands to benefit the most is Queen Laodicea. She's now the regent, per her husband's will, as her two boys are underage. So there's that thread to pull on. Does she immediately move to take the reins of power? One son, the younger boy, stands meekly by her side. But where is her older son, who should be the heir apparent? She doesn't seem shocked or worried that he's vanished. She obviously has a hold on the younger boy, but her older son is not by her side. I'm making a creative choice here to slightly bend history. In reality, Mithridates didn't flee in the immediate aftermath of his father's assassination. In fact, he remained in Pontus for quite a time afterwards. He fled because his mother favoured his younger brother, Mithridates Crestus, and began to plot against the elder Mithridates' life. But I'll take creative licence here and have Mithridates run immediately after the poisoning. Maybe we could even have an attempt on Mithridates' life in the minutes after Dad is whacked. 
would this work? I mean, how do I portray that? Maybe we'll go in the opposite direction of a quick, quiet poisoning and instead contrast it with a dramatic attempt on his life in the middle of the street. An assassin with a dagger tries to whack Mithridates as he and his crew attempt to reach their horses. Mithridates' loyal friends kill the assassin and save the prince's life. This is an aspect of this podcast that's going to happen regularly. There's times when I'm going to take liberties with the historical events and slightly alter things to fit how I think the HBO version of the story should go. It's going to be minor to medium-sized things. I'm not rewriting huge chunks of history here. But what I will do is accomplish what I set out to do with this podcast. Reconcile my twin loves of ancient history with narrative storytelling as best as I can. That means slightly altering, bending or warping facts a little bit. But the most important thing here is that I tell you about it. I want to be as upfront as I can about how and when I choose to deviate from the factual narrative. I don't want listeners to believe it's an accuracy instead of a conscious decision. HBO's The Poison King is going to be built upon a traditional cinematic triad structure, stretched out and slowed down to accommodate the scale of these events. So right off the bat, we've got action. We've got a poisoning. We've got a murder and a quick change of power. We've got a suspicious gang of young men fleeing. We've got an attempted knifing in the street. We've got this beautiful, sunny, fresh, Greco-Persian kingdom as a backdrop. Historical sources tell us there may have been attempts on Mithridates' life through a variety of means, not just the fictional stabbing that I've mentioned for our show, but from some very real attempts to poison him. Let's take a brief time out from our main narrative and discuss an aspect of Mithridates' personality, one that has truly transcended time and captured the imagination of readers and history lovers ever since. It's also given us the sobriquet that Mithridates has so rightfully earned, the Poison King. Poisoning an enemy or potential threat was a common occurrence in the ancient world. It offered an alternative to physically murdering someone by shoving a sword through them, though it was perceived by some at the time as a sneaky, cowardly, effeminate way of dealing with an enemy. Mithridates, as we've discovered already, came of age in a treacherous environment. Court intrigue, ever-shifting power dynamics and familial double-crossings. His own father, Mithridates V, was poisoned. There may have been multiple attempts to poison Mithridates as a boy. Why didn't these attempts succeed? Well, they failed due to his intricate experiments with toxins and poisons. He's even inspired a modern-day word to describe this process. Mithridatism is the practice of protecting oneself against poisons or toxic substances by gradually self-administering small, non-lethal doses. Mithridates feared being poisoned so much that he regularly ingested minor doses of poison, aiming to develop immunity over a protracted period of time. The vast lands that made up the Pontic Kingdom offered a bewildering variety of toxic plants, animals, insects, flowers, minerals and aquatic creatures. As Mithridates' realms continued to expand, more exotic substances from lands further and further away became available to his personal collection. There were arrow drugs from Mesopotamia, stingrays and jellyfish from Libya, insects and scorpions from Egypt, poison fish from Armenia, toxic sea slugs from the Aegean, crystallized snake venom from India, noxious mushrooms from Scythia, rhubarb from the Volga Basin, toxic roots from Arabia, lethal plants from Anatolia such as nightshade, henbane, monkshood, hellebore, and of course rhododendron honey, otherwise known as mad honey from the Black Sea coast. Each new toxin and ingredient would be closely examined and experimented with by Mithridates and his trusted team of alchemists and toxicologists, among which a certain Craterus of Pergamon was known. Craterus was an influential Greek herbalist and botanist. He shared Mithridates' love of experimenting with both poisons and antidotes, and acted as the king's personal physician. Craterus is described in ancient texts as a rhizotomist, or root-cutter. 
Mithridates was deeply passionate about toxicology and devoted much time to studying and perfecting the craft. For every poison, there was, in theory, an antidote. In a few choice passages I've selected from The Poison King, Adrienne Mayer describes the baffling scope of Mithridates' passion and work. Quote, The ancient authors say Mithridates was always accompanied by a group of shamans from a Scythian tribe north of the Sea of Azov, called the Agrari. Many in the court must have found these shamans frightening, but the weird snake charmers knew how to transform viper venom into medicine. Mithridates tended flocks of Pontic ducks, feeding them the baneful plants they preferred and harvesting their eggs, blood and flesh for his experiments. Hoping to exploit their ability to live on poisons, Mithridates mixed the blood of the Pontic ducks into his antidotes. It's likely that Mithridates' medicinal gardens were in secret locations at several royal residences. In his laboratories, under heavy guard, the Poison King would have stocked a variety of deadly minerals and biotoxins. The Roman natural historian Allian describes dreadful and rare natural biotoxins that could be obtained from India. One such poison, derived from purple snake venom, was so lethal that a drop the size of a sesame seed could kill. The most prized Indian poison was the mysterious Dechiron, said to be excreted by a tiny orange bird that nested in the Himalayas. A few grains of Dechiron, it was said, would bring a dreamy death within hours. It is one of the most powerful biotoxins known to modern science, even more potent than cobra venom. This precious substance was given exclusively by the kings of India to the kings of Persia, and Mithridates may have acquired some for his own pharmacy. End quote. That last paragraph is slightly chilling, isn't it? One of Mithridates' primary motivations for all this work was not just to kill his enemies, but be able to administer himself a quick death should he be cornered or pinned down. That kind of mentality speaks to the violent, treacherous world that the ancient Near East was. But the mastery of poison had other uses too, as Alexander the Great had found out centuries beforehand in a short excerpt from the Poison King. Quote, In India, for example, Alexander's men were dying gruesome deaths after being attacked with swords dipped in snake venom. End quote. And I'll skip a few paragraphs ahead. Toxic natural resources abounded in the Black Sea region. The nomads of Scythia dipped their arrows in sophisticated concoctions of viper venom and other pathogens. Their shamans were experts in antidotes based on venom. In Armenia's remote lakes lurked venomous fish, and Pontus boasted its own poisons. Even the flesh of Pontic ducks was poisonous. The ducks thrived on hellebore and other baneful plants and even the bees enjoyed a strange immunity to poison. End quote. Weaponizing toxic and poisonous plants and animals could have major implications for somebody with dreams of military conquest. I mean, this is chemical warfare for the ancient world. Imagine the psychological impact of facing an enemy that expertly uses such virulent forces against you. Mithridates' unquenchable thirst for knowledge and his serious dedication to toxicology really was a defining characteristic of who the man was. So back at the aftermath of the assassination, mystery still abounds. See, with ancient history, the sources from these events will often tell you what happened, but they won't tell you why or how. And oftentimes the truth is mixed in with a concoction of allegorical metaphors and karmic deliverance. There's often a lesson at the end of ancient tales. With events and stories so far back in our distant past, you gotta take this stuff with a pinch of salt. So, did Queen Laodice, the just widowed and newly crowned ruler of Pontus, attempt to whack her oldest son? 
And did she kill his dad, King Mithridates V? Maybe. I mean, it's plausible, but you just don't know. I'm a big fan of ambiguity in any narrative series or movie. I just think about the numerous times that The Sopranos had me scratching my head, wondering not just about the answer to a certain mystery, but whether having an answer even mattered at all. Ambiguity as a storytelling technique actually shares quite a bit of power with the audience. There's no right or wrong answer. Whatever conclusion the viewer reaches, that can be the answer. Or maybe there's no need for an answer at all. We all know that in life, things are rarely tied up that conveniently. Being able to adjust your own narrative is a powerful tool in connecting with the content you're watching. So let's play up to that here. Because with our limited knowledge of the ancient world, frankly it'll fit in quite well. Let's leave it ambiguous. Queen Laodicea might have clipped the old king. Then again, she might not have. But Mithridates ain't sticking around to be next. Let's pause for a second to inject a brief moment of colour. It's also a prime example of the dangers of a young prince trying to reach adulthood in a Hellenistic court. Young Mithridates, around ten years old, was attempting one day to tame a wild and powerful horse. The horse came close to throwing the boy off and could have easily killed him but his control over the animal surprised all who witnessed it. But there were whispers that the young horse was a deliberate ploy to have the heir killed in a quote-unquote tragic riding accident. Some even thought that Taryxapoi were responsible for the danger. These were the ghosts of dead charioteers who murmured in the ears of the horses to spook them. The phantom of a long-deceased rider now hovers around the horse's head and torments it. That's quite an image, isn't it? Some other sources describe the Taraxapoi as the apparitions of dead horses, or even just a physical location wherein both horse and rider will begin to panic and be overcome with terror. Taraxapoi roughly translates as horse frighteners or horse disturbers. I just absolutely love this story. And ancient history is full of anecdotes like this that are saturated in mystery, surrealism and otherworldly, ghostly elements. Returning to our story, Mithridates and his core followers go on the run. How long were they gone for? Again, the sources differ. Could have been somewhere within the time frame of five to seven years, possibly shorter. Adrian Mayer in The Poison King goes into great detail about this period of Mithridates' life either taking her information from the sources at or near the time, or else filling in a lot of the blanks with her best judgement, she envisions a band of rogue adventurers on the run through the vast expanses of northern Anatolia. They live roughly off the land, hunting, climbing, sleeping under the stars. How far in advance was this planned? It seems it was years in the making which would contradict my idea of having Mithridates and his crew flee in the immediate aftermath of King Mithridates V's assassination. So again, let's bend the narrative here somewhat. In our show, this flee into exile was planned in advance, but Mithridates just wasn't sure when to put the plan into effect. Until the moment Dad dies at the bottom of a poisoned chalice. Plus, it adds more weight to the opening chaos of Mithridates and company fleeing. They figure it's only a matter of time before they'd have to run. Who accompanies Mithridates on this journey? Well, his close friends and comrades. Who may have felt their lives were threatened now too, just by association with the young prince. We know a few names of close associates of Mithridates from his early reign. Maybe these guys can be part of this rogue adventure squad. There's Gordius, a Cappadocian who will be important to our story as it develops. There's Gaius and Diophantus. Then we have Doroilus, who is as close as a brother to Mithridates. Maybe all four of these guys are a part of this team, this kind of on-the-run band of brothers. In reality, the group was probably a little bigger than this, but we'll keep it in a small core group initially. Living off the land and keeping a low profile in the wilderness, Mithridates and his band of brothers go invisible for a while. We have the opportunity to have Mithridates visited by some ghost of memories past. 
I foresee this as quick flashes in his mind as he stares up at the stars at night. Queen Laodice staring at him in contempt. King Mithridates V clutching his neck in agony. A comet blazing across the sky in 135 BC. Mithridates' history tutor, Theopompus, telling him the story of finding huge skeletons of giant monsters, of what we now know to be the fossils of woolly mammoths. How about a flash of a wild horse, buckling in terror as a skeletal taraxopoi whispers into its ears? Maybe Mithridates would see Alexander the Great charging into battle on horseback. How about a pack of wolves roaming the streets of Pontus? I think quick flashes could work as a very effective narrative tool here. We're kind of planting some seeds in the viewers' minds. Some of these seeds will grow to be important plot points, so there is maybe not. But all of these fragmented, momentary glimpses of Mithridates' mentality, as well as his past or possible future, will add a little bit more meat onto the bones of his character. In all honesty, the mammoth skeleton flashback doesn't really do anything for our plot. I just think it's another wonderful moment of colour and adds some really atmospheric world building. So what's going on in Pontus? Well, Queen Laodice is ruling as regent for the boy king Mithridates Crestus. What's her explanation for why the actual heir has vanished? You can just imagine the rumours swirling around the court. Did she have a murdered too? And what of Mithridates Crestus, the soft, amiable boy king? Is he a helpless victim and snarled in his mother's tentacles? Or is he more involved in this conspiracy than he's letting on? Mithridates still has friends, his dad's supporters. It's highly unlikely, as with most murderous coups, that absolutely everybody jumped on board with Queen Laodice's side of the coin and supported killing the king. Maybe in this exile period, Mithridates visits these people, miles from Sinope and out of the reach of the Queen's triggermen. Mithridates would grow more familiar with his subjects, as well as the resources and the geography of his region. He's also going to build up numbers as more people like these flock to his cause. He's not just the legitimate heir to a murdered king, he's also mature, charismatic, and he's capable of wielding some big responsibilities. So what triggers the decision to go back? Well, Mithridates begins to hear of rumours of the antics back in the court in Sinope. Queen Laodice, known for her extravagant lifestyle, has become increasingly indebted to the Romans. She's selling out the kingdom to them, giving away territory, and dismantling the late King Mithridates V's legacy. Roman tax collectors and slave traders are already preying on western Anatolia, and now his mother is colluding with the hated Romans, selling off the Pontic kingdom piece by piece to prop up her expensive tastes and rogue regime? This can't be allowed to continue. Our hero and his brave band plot their return to Sinope. And again, as often with the exploration of ancient history, We don't really have many specific details about this event. All we have are a few dots that we join together. The dots in this case are as follows. Mithridates and his crew return to Sinope. Mithridates overthrows Queen Laodice and Mithridates Crestus and imprisons them both. Mithridates assumes power and is crowned King Mithridates VI. Mithridates marries his sister, also called Laodice. And from here on out, she will be referred to as Laodice the Younger, as opposed to her mother, Queen Laodice, or her older sister, Laodice the Elder. I know, that's a lot of Laodices. The ancients have a tendency to use the same names over and over again. So, other than these couple of dots, we don't have many specific details of this event. This is where our filmmaking comes to fill in the blanks. Firstly, Can Mithridates keep his return a secret? I think it's probably unlikely, given how his reputation in the lands outside of Sinope and the other big Pontic cities has been growing during his exile. Surely word would spread fast. Would his mother and brother be aware of his impending return? Or would Mithridates' network of spies and informants get to work? 
maybe he does just show up out of the blue one day, like a ghost from the past. The Queen has built a new capital for her regime, called Laodicea, if you can believe it. She entertains guests there, luxuriating in the hot sun and sinking copious amounts of wine. Maybe Mithridates knows that where she's going to be. Maybe he takes a gamble that Sinope will be relatively free of Romans because the Queen is on vacation right now. Maybe her and her sycophants will be drunk and helpless. So how does Mithridates play this one out? I can just picture it now, him and his loyal acolytes kneeling in the brush, moving stones around the dusty sand, planning their journey, concocting their moves. There's a nervous tension in the air. There's no guarantee this is going to work, and if they fail, it's a certainty they'll die. The plan is going to be a simultaneous two-pronged assault. Mithridates must split his forces. Strike Team 1 goes to Sinope to accomplish several goals. Number 1. Eliminate the Queen's top-ranking courtiers and partisans. Number 2. Capture buildings such as treasuries, palaces and fortresses, buildings that act as symbols of authority and are the regime's command structure. The third objective is to capture Mithridates' siblings, including Laodice the Younger. I mean, this is a full-on coup d'etat. Mithridates has been steadily picking up recruits recently from all the areas he's been roaming. These soldiers are inspired by his desire to avenge his murdered father, and rescue the kingdom from the Roman puppets. Well, here's their first chance to actually do something. Mithridates will lead this team himself, as the seizure of power, via the takeover of Sinope, would be a task of both enormous risk and vital importance. We're heading for the conclusion of our first episode of our HBO series The Poison King. Let's end it with some high stakes, some dramatic action. So while Strike Team 1 heads for Sinope, Strike Team 2 depart for Laodicea. Their objective is to take the Queen's lavish castle at Icazari, paid for with Roman bribes and carved into a limestone bluff. But it's said to be poorly defended, built more for entertainment than for military defensiveness. It was probably an easy enough task in that case, but for the sake of dramatic license, let's make it a bit more of a fight. Darylus, Mithridates' close friend and trusted lieutenant, leads the team to capture Ikazari. Darylus and a small team, you know, could just be six or eight guys, infiltrate the castle. We're going to build a lot of tension here with silence, subterfuge and trickery, until they're caught. Maybe a few of Laodice's drunken, licentious, eunuch courtiers stumble around the wrong corner at the wrong moment. Maybe it's in the open courtyard of the villa. One group, the eunuchs, runs into the other, strike team two. The two groups stop on their tracks. They lock eyes. Hands drift towards weapons. Nobody speaks. But there's a lot of nervous blinking and a lot of darting of eyes. We're going to have this moment hang for an uncomfortable silence. Until all hell breaks loose. The two groups charge at each other and there's a bloodbath. People pair off. Some are thrown into fountains, others butchered against the beautiful marble walls. Mithridates' boys, our heroes, do pretty well. They're tough, hardened, and they're sober. They cut the drunken sycophants to pieces. The queen and her younger son, the ruler Mithridates Crestus, are captured. I just love the notion of a well-trained, highly motivated kind of hit squad on an assassination mission. The Persian king, Darius the Great, was supposed to have led one himself on a mission to assassinate a magi pretending to be his brother Bardia and save the empire from a pretender. In my research on the origins of the Pontic Kingdom and of the Mithridatic dynasty, I read that the founder of the family, Mithridates I, was allegedly a descendant of a member of Darius's hit squad. So maybe leading covert teams on dangerous missions to clip enemy leaders runs in the Mithridatic genes. The coup was a wild success. Mithridates and Strike Team 1 have succeeded too. Sinope is theirs. And again, the events that follow this aren't very well known to us. 
We know the Queen Laodicea and Mithridates' crests are both imprisoned. They're not killed outright as this might have seemed too extreme to the public. But then after an undetermined amount of time they're both dead. How? We don't know. We do know the Mithridates gave them both a royal funeral, but there's a lot of gaps to wonder about there. So how do I decide to portray this in our HBO series? Once Mithridates has taken the throne of Pontus, he just murders them both. They're a massive threat to his legitimacy and his authority. And it might provide an interesting glint on the kind of character we're developing in Mithridates up to this point. We've so far witnessed him as the adventurer, the soldier, the brave young prince. Let's throw a little bit of shade on this guy. Let's have him do some brutal stuff here. Have him kill them both and show the ruthless, violent side of these ancient figures. How does he kill them? Well, knowing our boy, poison is probably his preferred method. So our protagonist has just murdered his mother and brother, with little hint of hesitation or distress. He may have even used these murders as an opportunity to test more poisons. Anyone who survives in this world, including Mithridates, is probably a killer. Mithridates, now crowned as King Mithridates VI, marries his sister, Laodicea the Younger. Frankly, siblings marrying siblings would barely raise an eyebrow in this time and place, especially in the context of ancient dynasties trying to keep their bloodlines pure. The interbreeding of this nature actually does incredible harm to the children it creates, stunting their growth and inflicting them with numerous genetic disorders. The Ptolemies, the Macedonian ruling dynasty of Egypt from 305 to 30 BC, practice sibling interbreeding to the next level. And the further down the line we go on them, the more bizarre medical afflictions we discover. Just a quick note on Ptolemic Egypt. It was a Hellenistic, Diadochoi-created state based in Egypt. It was founded in 305 BC by Ptolemy, a close friend of Alexander and a member of his Somatophylax, his bodyguards. Ptolemic Egypt was a wealthy and highly centralised state, with a mixture of Hellenistic and ancient Egyptian culture. The Ptolemies were a long-reigning Egyptian dynasty. They ruled for 275 years, although some argue they can't be given the title of the longest dynasty as they weren't native Egyptians. They were the descendants of Macedonian Greeks. The final and perhaps most famous member of the dynasty, Cleopatra VII, was defeated by the Romans and committed suicide in 30 BC. Her death is often considered to be one of the last chapters of the Hellenistic era, as Ptolemic Egypt was the last major Greek kingdom in the Near East before the Romans conquered much of the region. So, we're at the end of our pilot now. Mithridates has overcome the odds. He survived some mortal domestic threats and has taken the crown. How could our pilot conclude? Mithridates crowning? His marriage to Laodicea the Younger? Him pawing over maps of Anatolia? Or how about a shot of the night sky? With a twinkling star glimmering in the cloudless east, while an unsettled stretch of gloom drifts in from the west. A combination of several of these scenes? Maybe. It's got to have that HBO end flourish to it. So this concludes the second episode of our podcast series on the life of Mithridates. Our protagonist is now on the throne and ready to begin his grand plans and ambitions, as Mithridates begins to deal with the kingdoms that surround him. So thank you so much for listening, and I hope to have you on board for the next episode of The Historical Motion Picture Organization. Bye for now, and thanks for listening. To subscribe to this podcast, just search for the Historical Motion Picture Organization on whatever platform you use, and hopefully you'll find me there. If you want to follow the podcast on social media, you can find me on Twitter by searching at HMPO Podcast, or on Instagram with the handle HMPO underscore podcast. You can find the show on YouTube 
by searching HMPO Podcast. And you can contact me directly by email at hmpo.podcast at gmail.com. Growing a podcast from humble beginnings is a very difficult thing to do. So if you can support the HMPO in any way, it would mean a lot to me. You can do this by following me on social media. You can share the podcast with even one other person. And you can subscribe to me and give me a good rating on whatever platform you listen on. I will really appreciate it. So thank you for listening. Thank you for your support. And I hope you'll join me again soon in the ancient past.